Thank you. So welcome to our uh, distinguished lecture series at the Texas m m Energy Institute. It gives me a great pleasure today to introduce Professor George Filippinis, who I have been very closely associated for many years, but those will come later. George started uh, as undergraduate. Uh, what he did is undergraduate the studies at the University of Thessaloniki in chemical engineering. Then he moved to the University of Minnesota, where he did his PhD studies. And then he had an extraordinary career spanning the private sector, venture capital firms, the public sector, and then in academia. After his PhD, he, he joined the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Denver, where he also you know, during that period, he also completed his MBA. And then he moved to Boston as part of the Thermo Fisher Scientific, which is a Fortune 500 company. After which, then he joined the Applied Research Center in Miami. He started an academic career there and eventually moving later to University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida where he's an associate dean for research and the professor in the Palatine College of Global Sustainability there. George has been prolific, always working in the biotechnology sector, leading and directing technology development and commercialization for renewable energy and grid products in partnership with industry and government. He has been prolific both as a author, but also uh, through a number of patents in clean technologies, and he's going to give us a tour of exciting developments in this space for renewable fuels and products for a sustainable society. George. Thank you, Stavis. Let's welcome warmly Professor Philippine. Sir, and we are in business. Great. Very glad to be here. Uh, great weather. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have to worry about living Florida. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really good to be here. And uh, um, what I would like to do today is um, share with you some of the work that we are doing in hope that we can identify areas for uh, working together in the future. Okay, so this is not an academic lecture, uh, but rather, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some of the work that maybe uh, we can follow up. I would love also to hear what you guys do here. And especially if something here uh, sounds interesting or close to what you're doing, that's, that's, then I will have accomplished what I'm here to, in addition to seeing uh, Stratos here <laughs> after so many years. So, I'm at the Patel College of Global Sustainability. Uh, I don't know if we are still the only college of sustainability in the country. We used to be, maybe we are still. Uh, but it reflects uh, the, um, uh, the belief that uh, sustainability uh, is uh, something that we need to introduce throughout the activities of, of the economy, okay? It's not a field on its own like engineering or, or business, but rather a, a way of doing business and living that we can introduce in, across, across the board. Uh, so at the Patel College, uh, we accept students. We only have a master's program right now. So it's, it's kind of uh, reminds me of the master's program that you have here. We accept students from undergraduate from any field, okay? It's not, it's not designed specifically for engineers or scientists. Most of our concentrations, we have nine concentrations like energy, water, food, uh, entrepreneurship, transportation, and other ones, they are now a Master of Science MS. But some of them, like policy, they are MAs. And, and uh, what is great there is bringing students from journalism, from business, from all kinds of fields, so that we can start talking to each other because this is the way of the future. And we should have done this a long time ago, interdisciplinary. Otherwise, you're not going to go that far. So this is about the Patel College. 
And so you can take it out here. Yeah, I can I can use yeah. I can use them. Okay. Sorry about that. Don't worry So um I'm gonna go very quickly, although um I think Stratos covered all of these. Uh, I started in chemical engineering, and this is our hometown. <laughs> and then uh in Minnesota, I stayed in chemical engineering, but it was an opportunity for me to get into biotech, which I was fascinated about, although I didn't even know what an enzyme is at those times. So I had to start from scratch. And my very first class, I took biochemistry. The professor who was teaching it, someone told me, based on his accent, someone told me he's from Texas. <laughs> I won't forget that. Jim Fuchs. So I had a very hard time coming from Greece to understand what he was talking about, not to mention that biochemistry for me was like a foreign language at that time. And then, as uh, Stratos mentioned, I did the MBA and my MBA in, uh, in, in Denver and started at NREL. That's when I got the opportunity to use biotech in the energy sector, using a lot of uh, microorganisms to produce fuels and later products. And the Thermo Fisher, we expanded that, uh, which was nice. Uh, in Miami, did that. Then I had an opportunity to work as a clean tech. Everyone knows what clean tech is, right? Clean technologies from environmental to renewable energy to a smart grid, all those kind of things. Uh, at the, at, at the um, at Crossbow Ventures, which was a venture capital firm, and uh, eventually uh, moved to the, uh, to the Acto Academia so that I can claim that I have tried all three, you know, <laughs> areas. Uh, so that's where I am right now. And uh, I do have a lab where we do biofuels and bioproducts uh, work with uh, graduate students and postdocs. And because we don't have a PhD program, I am reaching out to other departments, like a lot of chemical engineering, uh, biology, chemistry, to bring students into this work. Some of the highlights, um, uh, started a couple of companies uh, in the area. In the chemistry, uh, we're looking at um, kind of uh, taking advantage of the global uh, supply chain to identify sources of bioactive components needed in pharmaceuticals, and then match suppliers with, with manufacturers. Uh -huh. So my partners are in Argentina, and uh, we just started this uh, enterprise only about a couple of months ago. So very excited about that. Uh, also, if you are not familiar, I would encourage you to look at Fulbright opportunities. It's great because you can go around the world and, uh, and develop relationships. And uh, uh, I did one at McGill University in, in sustainable agriculture. Uh, I went to Taiwan uh, and uh, I'm working now on a new one. Hopefully by the end of the year, I will be visiting Colombia at uh, Rosario University to work on algae with them. And I have had the opportunity to work with, uh, to advise uh, the Department of State on policy issues and strategic materials uh, with the um, Southern Command in, in Miami when I was there, USDA, a lot of work with the Organization of American States, and also with uh, the Florida Energy Office, and to work on some uh, boards of private companies. So the field, the primary field where I work is what we call the bioeconomy. And this is the economy where we use ecosystem services. So services provided by nature, which is happening already, except we somehow don't have a way to monetize, to appreciate it, and to realize uh, the impact if we don't really start developing sustainable ways of taking care of, of those things. We use natural resources, and I will expand on that a little later. And the way we transform A to B to C is, is the practices that we are trying to turn more sustainable. And there we're not talking only about lower carbon footprint, but also we're talking about the minimizing the effect on air, water, and the soil, because these are the resources we have to grow agriculture, agricultural products, and pretty much anything we need in everyday life. So a lot of my work is really on the nexus that I understand you here are waiting a lot, which is the few nexus food, energy and water. My primary emphasis is on energy and food. 
I understand you work a lot here on water and energy. So this is a great way of really uh, putting those things, uh, those things together. And, and although water is essential, minimizing water use and uh, being able to reuse and recycle water in our process is very important. The tools that uh, we use are primarily biochemical engineering, a lot of microbiology and biochemistry, including genetics. And I will talk a little bit about those things. Uh, not a lot, but if anything in genetics and metabolomics uh, rings a bell for any of you, we can discuss it later or uh, uh, afterwards. But at the same time, we need to bring economics and finance into that. We need to take advantage of, uh, you know, or explain, explore policy issues. Um, and sustainability. Sustainability not only in the process, but in the supply chain, as, as we spoke with, uh, with Dennis earlier. So we are trying to develop this biorefinery concept, which is not using any more fossils, especially oil, but using instead natural resources. These are the natural resources I was talking about. There's a point. I can use the uh, cash rate. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we are introducing those natural resources being algae, microalgae, or macroalgae, like seaweeds. Although I don't work on macroalgae, I work on microalgae. A lot of biomass is available from agriculture and from other operations. And also vegetable oils, but with a preference towards non edible vegetable oils. The mantra here is don't touch the food. We don't want to affect the food chain. We want to look at what else is available out there because creating green energy but turning people making people hungry is not the way forward right so that's very important and then developing the green box and this is where a lot of engineering comes into play how can we develop processes or change our processes so they can become more sustainable and as far as what we are producing a wide range of products by, by far, the emphasis has been on fuels for so many years. But those require huge economies of scale. Those require those big companies that, like Exxon and BP that have access to capital to move in that direction. For me, the opportunity in the shorter term is on the next one, which is developing chemicals, nutraceuticals, and cosmetics basically consumer products, okay? While we are helping develop also the biofuels. And I forgot to mention, when we talk about biofuels, we're referring to ethanol. Everybody's familiar with ethanol, right? Many, uh, most of our gas uh, sold these days is already blended with just a little bit of ethanol, but um, that has been pushed to about 15%, but I think it can go a lot higher. Biodiesel, also very important. and. My third topic that I will cover towards the end is gonna be focusing on sustainable aviation fuels. You may be hearing or seeing on the news a lot these days about SAFs. So sustainable aviation fuels, they come from many different types of feedstocks. They are becoming very important because, not because of US, but of European policy. The EU is gonna put carbon emission limits to uh, airliners. And therefore, the airlines are taking the airline companies are taking this very, very seriously, which is great because it helps us develop those technologies. Everything is global, right, these days. So uh, this is a very important thing. So the nutraceuticals and the chemicals, and also at the same time, we have to realize we can produce fertilizers, we can produce animal and fish meal, very important sources of protein, which is very important for human nutrition. Okay. Biological remediation, we, have, we can use the algae to also do environmental processes. Let's not forget that. We are focusing on high end products like the chemicals and the nutraceuticals, but there are also environmental applications. And also at the very end, I mentioned power and heat, they're not as valued as much, but they are equally important, especially in other countries where the cost of electricity is very, very expensive as opposed to many parts of this of, of our country here that is rather uh, cheap. What are those natural resources I already mentioned? Algae, and these are the names of the algae, not very important. They can be marine algae growing in salt water or algae that grow in fresh water. 
and some of them grow in brackish water, which is in between. Agricultural biomass, that millions of tons generated and considered waste, that waste. For us, these are feedstocks. This is very important. So in Florida, I've been working a lot in sugarcane. It's one of the few places in the country where sugarcane grows. But I have worked a lot in Latin America and also Southeast Asia. There's a lot of sugarcane. Why? Because of the sugar. But they are left with the bagasse, which is the fiber, which just sits around. And we can convert that into other things. So very important resource. And finally, finally, uh, vegetable oils, inedible. So in, in the last part of the, uh, our, our discussion today, I'm gonna to talk about brassica, carinata, which is an inedible cover crop that presents a lot of opportunities to produce uh, aviation fuel and a lot of things, including provide the farmers with an opportunity for a winter crop, which in the Southeastern US where winter is mild, they don't do it. So we could generate, and it's very important to bring the farmers in. They are gonna be our supplies. Without them growing large uh, amounts of land, we cannot build an industry, okay? We need that. And also use vegetables. So you're thinking about sources now where farmers specifically plant this, or you're using byproducts, or you're thinking about byproducts of the main crop production? Byproducts first. So we don't have to use an extra uh, you know, square foot of land because there's so much we can start there without affecting anything really. Finding better uses, higher value uses for something that is waste material. At the same time, we're looking at agriculture because biofuels and bioproducts is basically agriculture. That's where they're coming from. We're looking at agriculture as a source of new materials, as long as we can fit it into the existing practices. And that's why we're looking at winter crops in the warm climates and summer crops in the colder climates where the land just stays, you know, without really any nice. use. Yeah. And I will explain that. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, it's a naive question. Uh, I totally understand your constraint about the <coughs> uh, Is there any chance you can release this constraint and just use also edible and see if there is in the end any way to have gain also to help poor people and no can get etc. Yes, absolutely. Actually, we have experienced that with ethanol because about 20, 25% of the corn, for instance, it's diverted to ethanol. Has that resulted in, uh, in food price increases? Historical data do not support that. But there is a limit. Latin America, Colombia, a lot of sugar goes into, into uh, fuels. But Brazil, Brazil, half of it goes into fuels. So yes, there is a way to do that. We are doing it. This is the first generation, we call it, of biofuels, where we use food as a source. But for the future, for more sustainable future, we think that we cannot hit that limit where it's going to start affecting the food supply chain, because then prices and availability of food is going to become an issue. But that's a, that's, that's a question, yes. So that restriction is self-imposed right now, so we can force ourselves to think outside the box. Because converting food into energy, it's very straightforward. It's, it's quite straightforward. The challenge is non-food materials. They're harder to break down types of, of natural polymers, okay? So the, the research focus is algae. We are looking at uh, what, how they behave, how they grow, how they, we can affect their genetics, because if we affect their genetics, they can make them better performing. Lipids are very important in algae. We can use them for fuels and for other materials. And, and even a part of lipids that are called phospholipids can be used for, for increasingly for cosmetics. And then biomass, we are trying to break it down. I will explain those things. We are looking at the production of organic acids as starting materials, uh, basically replacing uh, oil-based or refinery-based organic acids by biorefinery-based ones. And what I find very interesting, trying to marry the two areas, biomass and algae. They, they, tend, they, they used to be separate areas, trying to sometimes compete with each other. We're bringing them together. 
because we found out that if I can break down and make sugars from biomass, I can feed that sugar to algae and they grow faster than they would grow just with CO2 and light. So that's, that's a very good area to, uh, to, to explore further. And then with the oils, we'll talk about jet fuel and all of those things. So this is, this is what algae, how, how, how the algae uh, work. We spend a bit of time on screening and finding interesting ones. And then we can grow them. They consume CO2. Let me lose the pointer here. They consume CO2. Most of the algae, they like to be, uh, to, to be exposed to sunlight. Okay, we call them photo or photo autotrophic. That's what it means. But there are algae that grow faster and they are more productive on sugars. Now, this is much cheaper than this. That's why we need to find sugars that are inexpensive. And that's when I started thinking about, hey, biomass. <laughs> the so-called waste could be a source. We also need to fill them with a lot of nutrients. Those nutrients are nitrogen and phosphorus. Sounds familiar? These are the exact components in wastewaters that use eutrophication in nature. We can bring them to the algae and they would love to incorporate and produce mass as opposed to being released into the environment. And a lot of water. So we've got to think about ways to recycle and reuse the water. Once the algae grows here, we harvest them, okay? And when we harvest them, that's what it looks like. Paste, green paste material. That material then can go into downstream processing so that we can extract the lipids and we can produce sustainable aviation fuel. That's not the only distillate we can produce. At the same time, we produce diesel and naphthalene. So we get these three main distillates. So that sounds like refinery now, right? Familiar territory. Actually, from this point on, this could and should be done inside existing refineries. We don't need to build from scratch. We can co-locate algae cultivation facilities with existing operations to reduce the capital and the operating expenditures. Then we can produce nutraceutical and cosmetics from the lipids and the protein inside the algae is excellent for animal feed and fish milk, like aquacultures, for instance. Okay, so this is in a simplistic way. This is the how we do it. And this is what we expect to get out of the algae. And just to give you an idea of what those things look like, on the left, this is dry algae. On the right is uh, omega-3 fatty acids isolated from the algae. And I don't know if you're familiar with omega-3 fatty acids. These are essential fatty acids, only unsaturated. These are the type of acids you want to consume at the expense of saturated. Okay, so when you consume something, look at the label. You want it to be low on saturated, higher in monounsaturated, and even higher in polyunsaturated because they are components that our body, our metabolism needs so that we can stay healthy. And many times we talk about consuming fish. Well, you know where the fish gets this from? From the algae, from the plankton they consume in the ocean. So we are trying to bypass the middleman, the fish. Let's go directly to the supplier, okay? And that supplier is, is microalgae. So if we can grow them, we can isolate those things. So it's, it's, it's really nice to work with those kind of things. And we spent quite a bit of time trying to learn how to best cultivate the algae to grow them. So I already mentioned uh, the types of algae and what they use. And we start small, very small in the lab, a little bigger. Then we start going into pilot scale and eventually we go into units, modules that we are growing. At, at a scale that could be replicated for commercial development. So I have an outdoor facility where I can show collaborators, official collaborators, and investors also how we are doing it. And then we can go to a larger scale and then we replicate. So modular, very modular. You can start small and then basically run in parallel other units to grow uh, the, the scale. Uh, a lot of uh, studies of the physiology because it's, it's, it's very important to understand what the algae like and what they don't like. 
if we have stressors, if we grow the algae outside, can you control the temperature outside? You cannot. You're at the mercy of, of mother nature, right? So what's going to happen to my productivity? Think of yourselves as a businessman or a businesswoman. And you're saying, oh my gosh, tomorrow we're going to have 90 degrees. What is it going to do to my system that is growing outdoors? You need to know. Can we develop the algae to become more thermotolerant? So it can resist that? That's very important to understand. Okay? So we need to know that in advance. Almost building resilience. It's the starting point of developing resilience strategy. So you're not going to go out there and put millions of dollars to work just to find out that the system is fried, okay? Because it was 90, 95 degrees. So that's very important to understand. And that's what physiology means, trying to understand how the algae work. And then a lot of studies, we love to grow the algae, harvest, leave some behind and restart, and restart. So a lot of fed bats mold. And can we keep the productivity high? We're trying to understand, you know, how much should we harvest? How much should we left leave behind so that we have fast growth in the next cycle? How can we minimize what we call the lag phase? Because this costs us money. Time is money. During that phase, it's very slow growing. Why? Let's find out and minimize that. And of course, we want to see at the growth rates, how we can improve those things. So a lot of good information that will help us to develop better systems. And a lot of details, growth kinetics, I'm not going to go into the details, but I want to spend a second here trying to understand what is the effect of crucial variables on the productivity of the system. So don't worry about the data. What is important here is we're trying to look at CO2, light, the effect of light, the effect of the nitrogen source, the effect of our startup material, the effect of the pH. And to give you an example, why do we care so much? We do care because this costs money. So the question is, well, we're using in the lab nitrates that are rather expensive if you're going to go out and buy those things. We can use ammonia, we can use urea. Urea is by far a lot cheaper. It does the cells. So can we outdoors expect to be profitable and survive as a business if we rely on what we use in the lab, the answer is no way. So I want to know, can I use urea at one tenth the cost? So we got to study this and see what is the effect on productivity and whether the answer is yes or no. So just an example of those studies. Then I mentioned water. You guys know from the work you are doing, it's, it's scarce, it's becoming scarcer. We got to protect potable water. So the question here is, can we recycle some of the water? Because the algae need a lot of water to grow in. So what we do is we have studies where we use spent media, we call it. Basically, some of the water that we have used already, we try to recycle. And we are following what is happening inside the cell and outside of the cell. Is anything accumulating? Because what we found out is we can use some spent media, maybe for one cycle or two. But after that, it becomes inhibitory. It, it poisons the algae. What causes that poisoning? Is it something building up inside the cell? Or is it something accumulating outside the cell? Because if it's outside the cell, we have some ideas, right? Filter them out, do something, process it. If it's inside the cell, then we go to the genetics. What exactly? is being affected. And can we genetically engineer the algae so that they can resist, they can tolerate and, be, and stay productive? And what we found out is these are extracellular components, especially humic acid over here, that is building up. And it's affecting the way the nitrogen and the phosphorus are transporting into the cell. So it's like someone increasingly taping over your mouth and you cannot eat anymore. That's what's happening. And that's why the algae are not doing well after a second or third cycle. They are losing the ability to transport nutrients into the cell. So that is giving us some ideas. So we're looking at the effect on algae productivity and production costs. 
effect on cell metabolism and ideas on how we can use tools to improve the uh, productivity of the algae. So what we do is we analyze all the chemicals that are inside the cell. And this is a new tool, metabolomics. We have, we have not, we haven't developed it, but we are using it now as a tool. It has become very popular in the last five years or so, where we can look at each, can you believe this, each single chemical that is inside the metabolism of the cell. And we can see which ones are affected positively, increasing their expression, as we call it, and which ones are affected negatively. So wherever you see something red compared to the blue, this is spent media, the recycled stuff, versus the fresh. That means that these chemicals, they are doing better in the presence of recycling. But there are a number of other chemicals that may be very crucial to the function of the algae that are dropping in expression, okay? Now, if we can figure this out, who, what is happening to which element, then we know how the metabolism works. It's very complex, but it's known what pathways, and we can start following around and figuring, getting, coming up with ideas. Well, if we can express that enzyme to higher levels, maybe we can change the pathway and instead of going from A to B, we can go from A to C and, and things like that. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. It becomes, goes into a lot of chemistry and bio, a lot of biochemistry, but just wanted to give you an idea of exciting tools that are really changing the, the game here in terms of developing better strains. And then we got to go and grow these algae if we're going to produce all these products. And the, lo the low cost way of doing it is outdoors. Very large volumes, low investment, but no free lunch. Low investment, low density, high risk of contamination. If there is wind, it's going to bring into your open pond anything that is around it. Not good, low yield. Okay, a lot of water to process. You always have to think about downstream processing. So is there an alternative to that? Yeah, we can grow them indoors. In, in system checks, so not, not indoors necessarily. In closed systems, high investment, a lot of money to spend. But the benefit is high density, low risk of contamination because the system now is enclosed, high yield. So high capital and operating costs. So our thinking there is, can we combine somehow the low investment with a high yield, is there a way to do that? Let me ask you a question. So, so you talk about CKP. CKP. It's okay, it's okay. That's the whole so, thing here. <laughs> so what do you mean exactly by contamination? Other microorganisms, bacteria, that can grow in, in that and compete, out-compete the algae. So they corrupt, right? They corrupt your yes, yield. Yes, they consume. They are freeloaders. They consume the nitrogen and the phosphorus, take it away from the algae. What a sucks. Yeah, like parasites. Human parasites. <laughs> Some of them are. <laughs> also, another concern I have is grazers. These are organisms that eat the algae. Okay? So that's where you draw the line. Say, not under my words. <laughs> I want to grow the algae. I don't want my algae to be eaten by something that is rather useless for us. So that's what got us into designing some new systems, which are enclosed with high density polyethylene. Uh, we use a depth of only a couple of inches, so very little water. We can circulate the water around so the algae don't drop to the bottom and become non-productive. So we're trying to combine those features of low cost while maintaining high productivity, use a lot less water, that's very important, okay? Put a barrier to contamination because the system is enclosed. It's very modular because you can build several of those. And we develop a system that can be placed on the ground or even on water. We have customers that are interested in growing the algae, but floating them because the land can be used for agriculture, like for making food. Can we put them in the water, in a pond, for instance, and grow the algae? So that's the floating system there. 
And then we use uh, some of the tools, uh, traditional tools of engineering, so that we can design that system better. For instance, anything blue here indicates a very slow uh, velocity as it circulates. That's not good for biological systems. When they are not in circulation, what do they do? They settle. When they settle, they cannot absorb water. Uh, sorry, uh, they cannot uh, photons. So they have become not productive. We don't want them to settle. They have to be in circulation. So what can we do so that we can eliminate or minimize the blue areas? In other words, optimize the mixing. So that's when these tools come in very handy, where we start playing with how many paddle wheels, what kind of speed, size, where should we locate, place those paddle wheels, what should be the aspect ratio of the reactor, should we use baffles at the ends, will it improve that? So a lot of interesting stuff to improve the design now of, of this system, okay? Process automation, very important. Uh, labor is one of the major components. The, the, the highest component of the operating cost is one of the highest is labor. How can we minimize labor in terms of monitoring and harvesting? So there, what we do is, you know, this is a typical cycle of the fed bats I mentioned to you earlier process. And then, yes, we are monitoring temperature and pH, but really it is here where the labor cost is very important. How can we develop online probes and sensors to tell us when is the right time to harvest? How is our culture doing? Without having to send out workers to do that manually, take them half hour, an hour, to tell us what is happening. Can we put probes in there that can tell us right away something is wrong so we can take action or it's ready to harvest? Are we maintaining the algae happy? The algae need nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, so that's very important. Here is a real example of outdoor cultivation. Half a year with no problems whatsoever. And this is the system that one of the systems were developed. So we were very happy to see that we could go for long periods of time. Don't worry about the numbers. Take my word, they look pretty good, okay, compared to what can be done. So this was like a feasibility. Can we do it? Because if we can do it outdoors, and in Florida, where we, in summertime, it gets really warm. Wintertime is really nice. But in summer, we could hit very high temperatures, okay? So this is a very good proof of concept that we can take further. So what we found out is just a summary here. The culture looks very high density, little contamination. And, and how are we doing with time? Great. Great. Okay, time is there. So reduce energy use, very important, along with water use. Okay, that panel will there, it consumes just a few watts of power, just a few watts. So we reduce that. Okay, very little water we use. So we don't have to impact the uh, the utilization of water. And very importantly, reduce the capital cost. So our projections when we did the techno-economic analysis was that we can be maybe close to $25,000 a hectare, which is uh, almost an order of magnitude lower than uh, a lot of other commercial systems. Not as much the open parts as the closed systems. So we're getting to the point where this potentially could compete with the open ponds, but with the added advantages of high productivity and no contamination. Okay, so this is this is a driver for us. Lower than current systems, comparable to open ponds, but with much better productivity. And this is the way we envision it. If we're going to grow algae that are autotrophic, that need CO2, ideally we would like to co-locate with sources of CO2. And there are plenty of sources of CO2. Just to mention a few utility companies, cement plants, notorious for CO2 yeah. production. You need pure CO2, what? No, we can tolerate with a caveat. We have to analyze what is coming off the stacks. Obviously we have to cool it down, but we want to see what's in there. And when we grow algae with synthetic gas that mimics natural gas fired power generation, the algae did very well. But if we start seeing sulfur levels 
and other contaminants, then either we have to do adaptation of the algae or we have to do some cleanup before we feed it. Okay, so this is very important. So then these are the units. Remember I said modular? That's how we envision them. This is one of these units. And then we grow the algae, we capture it, and then we process it the way I showed you in the simplified PFD. Uh, so for, the, for the commercial development, you already decided the open pond is the way to go as opposed to the closer ones? Or no, this is, the systems, this is our systems, this is the, systems the enclosed. The enclosed ones. Okay. Yes, the enclosed ones, right. But it, 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 hasn't, it hasn't been commercialized yet. You may have seen the Exxon commercial. Um, I don't see them, but the beautiful open ponds, right? And you won't believe, I've been working in this area for about 10 years. And it took the Exxon commercial to people, for people to start calling me and say, oh, that's what you're doing. <laughs> so look, I'm not working with Exxon, but yes, what the commercial shows you a little bit of that. So uh, I don't know if I should thank Exxon, but anyway, we'll skip that. Um, moving away now from, from uh, the uh, fuels, a little bit into the cosmetics, which um, I will need, as others maybe we will need, <laughs> as we grow older, <laughs> all of us. So can we make cosmetics? By the way, I volunteered in the lab. I will try anything, okay? <laughs> so uh, these are biological sources, the algae. And many of those cosmetics, they come either from food, like soybeans, even from eggs. So what we're talking about here is not displacing oil, but rather leaving alone the food and trying to use the algae as a source of those materials. And they are used in liposomes, emulsifiers, solubilizers, and, and those things. The beauty with uh, some of these uh, materials, the phospholipids, which is phosphorus containing lipids, is that they have a hydrophilic and hydrophobic component, okay? They can form this liposome here so that an active, a bioactive component could be facilitated to transfer either through the skin or even later on with pharmaceuticals, bioactive components in the body being delivered basically to the receptors so that can be more efficiently used by, my, by, by uh, our, uh, our body. So this is, this is some opportunities we see there with those. And don't worry about these, there are different types of lipids. I just wanted to mention that these are lipids specifically found in the membrane, not inside, in the membrane of the cell. Okay, so the cell makes those, has to make those, otherwise it will not have that membrane to resist uh, the environment. So it's very important. That's where we're getting those from. And we're doing research there, trying to produce them, isolate them. Uh, we can even go, can go continuous cultivation. And, and then the challenge comes in downstream processing. How do we separate these things? Yeah, in the lab, I can use chromatography, but how do we scale this up? Okay. So if you have any ideas, mm -hmm. we, can, we can talk about these things because we need to separate them. They can have different applications. So that's, that's an area of, of active interest of, of separation. The second area is biomass research. Biomass is anything green that you see. And um, we got a couple of very important natural polymers called cellulose and hemicellulose. Cellulose is a polymer of glucose, six carbon sugar. Hemicellulose, five carbon sugar, called, called xylose. These are the things we're after. This is what nature produces in huge amounts. For us, is dollar signs, sugars, non-edible sugars, okay? So what is the goal? How do we break these polymers into the single sugars and then feed them to microorganisms to make for us a range of products? So that's... That's something I worked a lot at Enron, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and also in the private sector, working on, on biomass. And this is how biomass is converted. It goes through chemical pretreatment. Then it goes through enzymatic treatment. Eventually, we release the sugars. Those can be fermented by yeast or bacteria. They produce CO2 that can go into carbonation or dry ice making not released into the atmosphere. This is very good quality CO2. Shouldn't waste it. It's a byproduct that uh, generates income. And then from the fermentation, we go into the distillation. We can recover our ethanol or butanol. Butanol is coming behind, behind ethanol. Butanol is closer in performance to gasoline than ethanol, but it's more expensive. 
But there's a company, publicly traded company, Jibo, that is, is developing those technologies. Very interesting stuff. Organic acids. And what is left from the distillation, the water can be recycled and reused. Fertilizer, there are nutrients that came from the plant, biomass. And what we cannot utilize, we can do cogen. So we can produce electricity and steam for the entire process. Okay? And this is a picture of uh, sugarcane uh, plantation. Actually, this is material that we have used in the past. Now, I know sugarcane is something that you can say, well, uh, we can focus on it. But as far as the states are concerned, there's very little sugarcane we can grow. It's just the climate is not that good. It's Louisiana, Louisiana, mostly in Florida, South Florida, and Hawaii. Maybe a little in Texas, but that's about it. So we thought, well, let's spend our energy on something that is more widely used. Sweet sorghum is used worldwide. It has a very high photosynthetic efficiency, just like sugarcane, but it's more adaptable to various climates. So it can be grown in temperate climates as well as in semi-tropical climate, which is really good. They also are very resistant to both droughts, climate change, droughts, right? Mm -hmm. Increasingly, and salinity. Unfortunately, we also see with the rising sea level, we see contamination of our groundwater. So the salinity of that in the future may be going up. So this is a good candidate for not, not mitigation, but for resiliency, for instance. Part of the portfolio of resilient plants that we can use increasingly. And why would we uh, be interested in that? It can give us sugar, can give us fiber, can give us grain for animal feed, okay? I personally am interested in the fiber, in the bagasse. And this is the feedstock, the waste that nobody's using. That's the part. I'm not gonna touch the sugar for humans. I'm not gonna touch the grain for animal feed. I'm gonna touch the fiber, to find uses for that, okay? And what we have found out is, again, we're looking into the microorganism, because we need to understand that's our catalyst. It's a biological catalyst. What the microorganism does is, once we feed it sugar, we break down these polymers to simple glucose, it goes inside the cell. And it can follow these paths. It can give us, our target molecule is succinic acid, a four carbon molecule, but it can also go into acetic acid or ethanol. So the question is, how do we direct, can we direct, can we fool the cell to direct most of the carbon to our desirable end product? And then we notice that to go from this to this here, three carbon to four carbon, the cell incorporates a molecule of CO2. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> it consumes CO2. So what do we do? We maintain CO2 in the headspace of the reactor. And by doing that, we are pushing the reaction in this preferable direction without genetically engineering anything. Now, if it's not good enough, we've got to do the surgery. <laughs> we've got to go in and change the DNA, okay? But let's start with something more simple that is process related without even, because remember, I keep talking about genetically engineered, but there are limitations, right? Europe, for instance, is very anti-GMOs. Here in the US, we are more open to the idea, but we got to contain things. We cannot just let things go out. So if we have a choice, if I had a choice, I would first look at ways to not genetically engineer and then leave that as our last option. And I'm not gonna go into this, we just tested and we found out that this cheap renewable sugar from sweet sorghum is doing even better as a source for the microorganism than the pure expensive food derived sugars. That's great news. Why? Because the sorghum brings some additional nutrients and improves the, uh, the growth of the cells. And the last part, I want to talk to you about very quickly is sustainable aviation fuels. This is a picture of Brassica carinata. It's a cover crop. It has these nice yellow flowers. It is related to canola and camelina. I'm sure everybody is familiar with canola, right? The difference is canola and camelina are edible. Carinata is not edible, okay? So it's not edible, it's not NGMO, 
and the seeds it makes are very rich in oil. Because remember, the oil is our source for fuel and other chemicals. So keep an eye on that. It can grow very nicely in wintertime in the southeastern US. When the farmers are not growing anything. In summer, they are growing soybeans, cotton, peanuts, corn. In wintertime, the fields are idle. So can we give them a reason to grow something we need at larger scale? That's what we're trying. Additional income for the farmers, and it's also good for the soil. It prevents erosion of the soil, brings nutrients also into the soil. So this is the rotation of crops is very important for agriculture. So we do not remove the same nutrients over and over again. The seeds contain almost half of the mass of the seed is oil. So that's really good news. And then what is left, we call it meal. It's rich in protein and carbohydrates. So what happens here is Carinata gives us a lot more oil than camelina and canola, and still gives us almost the same amount of protein for animal feed. So we have a reason to pursue this as almost twice the camelina oil yield. So very rich, so that, that, that looks very promising for the economics. So there is a project that's going on. I'm working with um, the University of Florida, University of Georgia, Auburn and NC State. We formed a consortium, we call it Spark, and we are advised by industry. This is a company developing the seeds for Carinata. And this is a company that is converting the oil into fuel. They have done it actually. And we have uh, advice from the airline industry, the USDA, and the Federal Aviation Administration. So this has been a very big project that we work on collectively. And truly, we use engineering, we use sciences, sustainability, economics, business, supply chain, very important. Okay, the logistics, education, extension, community outreach. Everything needed to really turn this into, into really a system that develops and supports the bioeconomy. And you see here the different groups we have in that effort, covering all those ranges, but also not to forget to prepare our people. This is workforce development here, okay? As well as extension for the farmers and the community under the guidance also of the industry and the government. And I'm not gonna spend time on this, but it's, 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 it has a lot of components, but we need the farmers to grow it in large quantities and then give us the seeds. We are after the seeds. Those seeds can produce the jet fuel, the diesel, the naphtha, and byproducts. Very important. But this is the main path that we're getting there. Is this futuristic? No. The process exists, it's technically feasible, and we are working on commercializing. Okay? because there is so much demand now projected for sustainable aviation fuels. And not, no feedstock on its own is gonna do that. We got to bring everything. Carinata is not gonna save the world, but it's gonna be one of those pieces of the puzzle that could help in that direction. So it would be naive to think we're gonna do it on our own. No way. We got to use used oils. We got to use all kinds of oils, including Carinata oil to go in that direction. And then very importantly, we can develop very interesting bioproducts, including nylon, from one of the components that this Carinata seed is rich in called heuristic acid. Very important applications. And a lot of my group's effort is in this area where we are trying to develop against sugars because I'm thinking always about algae. And I develop some sugars and still allow this protein to go into the animal feed or to go into the food industry. So it's 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 a it's a complex but very very interesting, and that's why we say bioeconomy. You can make fuels for the economy, you can make chemicals, you can make consumer products for the economy, based all from a green and sustainable material. So I'm done. Uh, this is the lab uh, where we're doing the work. These are some of our algae outdoor facility uh, components. Just to acknowledge uh, the team, it's a small team. I have a postdoc um, and then three PhD students, chemical engineering, chemistry, chemical engineering, and a research associate. So I really look forward to working with, <laughs> with, with, with you guys and, and others so that 
we can expand the capabilities uh, of this. So, and with that, uh, I would be very glad to take questions. Thank you, George.